Good morning to all of you around the world, and may God continue to bless you and encourage you as we look into 1 Thessalonians, talking about excelling in faith and love. And our subtitle today is Receive and Walk in God. Receive and Walk in God. Or Receive God and also Walk in God. But we need to be moving forward in God. And that's what Paul is trying to say to the Thessalonian church, that we need to receive from God, but not only receive, but to walk. Or to put it the way James talks about it, don't just be a hearer, but be a doer also. And so we thank God for the opportunity to get into the Word of God, and that as the Word we get into it, I'm hoping that the Word of God will get into us. Uh, one of our, our people that watch every day made a comment that uh, was looking at a survey or something like that. And I think that it said in the survey that she sent me that it was about uh, people would read the Bible outside of the church setting, maybe three to five times. Uh, now, was that a year <laughs> or was that a week? I don't know. I'll have to reread it again. But it's just amazing how many people don't get into the Bible. And, of course, when they don't get into the Bible, you know, life doesn't change. It's the Bible that changes the life from the inside out. Amen. And we need to get into the Word. So thank you for joining us as we get into the Word today. And we're trusting that as we look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 to 8, we're going to see how we receive from God, but also how Paul encourages the church to walk in God. So let's get over to verse 1 of chapter 4, where Paul says, Finally, he says, Finally then, brethren, we urge and exhort in the Lord Jesus that you should abound more and more, just as you received from us how you ought to walk and to please God. Now, again, here's one of those times where we need to understand that the chapter verse or the chapter section kind of breaks it away from the previous section. Because if we look at the previous section, we would see that we're encouraged to abound more in the love of our Lord God. Well, Paul is saying, because you're abounding more and more, what is that more and more? That is that we're abounding more and more in the love of God. And so he's exhorting the church to continue to show forth that love. He says, I urge you, and the idea of urge is to desire or encourage or compel you, or to put it another way, and exhort in the Lord. The idea of exhort means to prod along, to push, even to press a little bit. So Paul is saying, I urge you, I'm prodding you along, I'm trying to get you to abound more and more in what he talked about in the previous chapter. Because if you go up to verse 12, he says, and may the Lord make you increase and abound in love to one another. So when we go the idea of abounding, he's still thinking of this idea of love one for another. And he says to you, I urge you and exhort you in the Lord, that you should abound more and more. Now, if I was to write that in English, nowadays, it'd say it's probably bad grammar. You're using the word more and more. <laughs> Paul wants to say, just don't receive so much, but even take it even to a higher level. More and more, just as you receive from us, you ought to walk and please God. So just as you receive the love, grace, and mercy from us, then you also need to take that which you have been given, and give it to others. One of the things that I notice that's different in history compared to now and then, a lot of times the, the early churches would, would do what their leadership would say to them to do. So when the leadership to them, hey, you need to abound more and more in love, they would then begin to think about, well, how do we do that? How do we activate that more in our lives so we can abound more and more? Where a lot of times in, in churches and preaching and teaching, and even what I'm doing in the morning, it's the idea that it's almost like, well, it, you're giving us information and we will ponder on it, think about it, and one maybe somewhere down the road we might do something about it. But Paul, when he was teaching the church, he would exhort them and even prod them, come on now, 
you need to do more and more of this. And I think it's not a suggestion, but it's something that Paul is requiring us to, to walk in. I can see that when people would receive this letter from Paul, or any of us would receive this letter, I would think that there was a many, many disciples would make a decision not to walk for in the Lord anymore, in Christianity anymore, because they would say it's too hard. It's too hard to keep loving. It's too hard to change. It's too, and so, and people don't like change. You know, people don't like going through the, the challenges of growing and maturing and changing. But Paul is saying, I'm exhorting you. I'm urging you more and more that just that you walk in this area of love and you walk in this area of what God is in doing as he establishes you and that you walk in it and just as you had received it from us, you also walk in it because as you walk in it, the purpose Paul is going to say throughout this scripture is you're not doing it to please me. You're not doing it to please someone else. He says here you're doing it because it pleases God. We do what we do is not so that we can get the pat on the back from others. We do what we do in Christ Jesus because it pleases God. That's what we have to sometimes get back into our thinking is the things that we're doing each day, are they are they pleasing God? Or are they just pleasing man? Or are they just pleasing ourselves? But we have to look at, is this what we're doing pleasing God? And I think sometimes we have to understand that and, and get encouraged by that and even ask ourselves that question because, you know, so often what we do, what we do, is to either get some type of results from other people or just to feel good ourselves. And I'm not saying any of those kinds of things are necessarily wrong, but Paul was saying, you know, you're abounding more and more, and, and uh, I'm encouraging you to keep walking in it because this pleases God. This, this will please God and be a blessing to God. He goes on in verse 2 and says, For you know... What commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus. So now he's not only urging and exhorting, but now he's commanding. I remember Dr. Chuck Nichols saying to me over and over again about the Great Commission in Matthew. He would always say, it's not a suggestion, <laughs> it's a command. And I, I would think about how often in churches when we pastors stand up and preach and teach and minister, many people say, well, that's a good suggestion. That's a good idea. But a command takes it even deeper. It comes with authority and instruction and in power. You're commanded to do it. You're not asked whether you want to do it or whether you would like to do it, but you're commanded to do it. And so Dr. Chuck Nichols would always say that, you know, come on now, the Great Commission is not a suggestion. Well, here Paul is saying, we came to you and we gave you commands uh, that came through the Lord Jesus. The, you know, to be part of the body of Christ is to obey the commands of Christ. I don't know why we think that, you know, we can be part of something by by just simply praying and saying, okay, I received Jesus, but I'm not going to do anything he wants me to do. It doesn't work that way. I think sometimes why the disciples uh, in the times of Christ, you know, there was the 12 disciples and then later on there was the 70. And as Jesus continued to talk to them and talk to them, they say, well, you know, this is too hard to do in ourselves. And it is too hard to do in yourselves. And they left. They left following Jesus because Jesus is not just an easy believism. It's, it's God coming into our lives to give us the grace and strength to fulfill his will in our lives. And so when Paul says here, for you know what commandments we gave you through the Lord Jesus Christ. So we gave these commandments on the behalf of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they're not suggestions these are things you are to do. You are to carry out. If you call yourself a person of the way or a Christian, these are the things 
that are part. Jesus says, I give you a new commandment. He fulfilled the old commandments, and that doesn't mean that there is no more commandments. And I'm talking about the New Testament because there's lots of things that the scriptures, the gospel, Paul and other writers tell us that we should be walking in. So that's why I say receive the things of the Lord that we've been urged and exhorted in, that we've been commanded to do, and then walk in them. Because look what he says in verse 3, for this is the will of God. For this is the will of God. What is the will of God? That we fulfill and walk in the commandments of the Lord. But he goes on and even adds a, a, a greater challenge because it is a great challenge because it's one of our big theological words that we don't like using too often. We know about it. We talk about it. But look what it says here. For this is the will of God, your sanctification. So there's a process that the will of God is to sanctify you, to cleanse you, to wash you, to take you on a journey that is going to make you upright and righteous before the living God. This is the will of God, your sanctification, that you should abstain for, from sexual immorality. Now, we don't understand too much, and it happened also amongst the Jews, if you go into the Hebrew Scriptures, but a lot of times temple worship also had prostitutes and everything else there. And so <laughs> it's a kind of a weird way of worshiping, but you would go in and, and worship and give your money and you would go in and worship your God and then go on a side room and do some other things, part of your worship. And the Gentiles did that quite often amongst their own gods. And so Paul was saying, you know, this is not the will of God. The will of God is, is that you, sanct you go through sanctification and you abstain from all sexual immorality. And immorality means you're being dishonest towards your covenant in the marriage or you're walking in depravity or sin. Paul says, don't do these things. This is part of of the will of God, that you be faithful to your partner. And if you're not, if you're single, that you be faithful to God. And so he's saying, don't do this. Because if you're walking that journey, you're not walking a journey of sanctification. You know, there is much going on in the whole area of, of lust and, and uh, sexual perversion nowadays. Just, it's all over the place. It's rampant. But Paul says, you know, if you're a follower of Christ, and he's saying to the church, church, if you're this, you're not that. You know, the church and disciples need to walk uprightly in the sanctification, and they need to abstain from sexual immorality. And that's not just being unfaithful or going and, and, and visiting prostitutes. That's the whole spectrum of sexuality whether it's pornography or other types of materials. We need to abstain. We need to get away. The idea of abstain means to stop. To stop. You know, when a person's abstaining from drinking, he stopped drinking. <laughs> you know what I mean? And Paul goes on, and, he, and if he didn't get this, he's going to run it by the church one more time. That each of you should know how to possess his own vessel in sanctification and honor. So now he takes it even a, a, a greater depth. He says, don't only just abstain from these sexual things that you're doing, but also now possess your vessel and that you possess it in such a way that it is now, again, bringing forth honor and sanctification or purity before the Lord. Because a true sacrifice before the Lord was to be one that was not found with spot or wrinkle. I mean, when you think about all how these scriptures connect back and forth, you know, Christ is trying to bring us to a place that we can be presented to the Lord without spot or wrinkle washed in the blood of the Lamb. And so that means we need to stop abstaining from certain things. We need to start possessing that which God has given us, our vessel, and using it in a way that is showing forth sanctification and honor to our God. He goes on to verse 5, not in passion of lust like the Gentiles who did not know God. 
So he's saying, church, don't be like the Gentiles, how they used to be and did all this kind of worship and did all kinds of things uh, perverted and sexual. They had no control of their vessels. You've been given a vessel. And the thing is, we need to be able to, through the power of the Holy Spirit and the strength of the Holy Spirit, to get control back of this vessel. Not in our ability, but in God. See, when we die to ourselves, we give it to Christ. And then Christ fills us. And then as the head of the big body, the church, and the head of this body, we are then to be able to move forward. So he goes on, don't be like the, you know, the passions of lust, like the Gentiles. And I said, you know, we, we think that this is old, you know, stories written back then that they're having all kinds of problems. Let me tell you, in North America, the passions of lust is rampant. It's everywhere. Now, it may not always come in a sexual form, but the enemy, the prince of this world, always wants you to lust after not only the opposite sex or whoever it may be, sex itself, but he wants you to lust after things and things that you think will bring you peace or bring fulfill the desires in your heart. And it's not the walk that we're supposed to walk. He goes on, verse 6, that no one should take advantage or of and defraud his brother in this matter because the Lord is the avenger of all such things as we also forewarned and testified. So Paul was saying, you know, hey, if you're going to, you know, sometimes people will justify what they do because of what other people do, you know. So the, the idea of defraud is, is that you've caught someone else in an act and uh, you're going to swindle out of them or deceive them or trick from them to get something from them to keep you from talking. And Paul was saying, you know, you shouldn't be defrauding. You shouldn't be going after one another like that. You know, you've all got struggles. You've all got challenges. And the only way you can overcome them is to walk in the Lord. So do not defraud your brother. And to realize that all things, all sin, all the stuff that people are doing, God is the avenger of that, or he is the judge of that. And... Paul is saying, I've warned you about this over and over again, that God himself is the judge. And we shouldn't be judging one another, but God himself is a judge. And he says, and Paul says, and I've testified to you concerning these things. Be careful. Paul was concerned about how they lived, how they were living in, in, in sexual issues, but also what they were doing to each other and how they were trying to take advantage and defraud one another. And Paul was saying, I warn you, I might not be able to be there to see all what you're doing, but I warn you, God sees all things. You know, nothing goes unaccounted for. What goes on around the world, we think that sometimes God is sound asleep or he doesn't know or he's busy over in one part of the world and and doesn't know what's going on. God sees all things all around the world. And the Bible says, and everything is being recorded. And the thing is that there will be a day of judgment where we will have to stand before the Lord. And no one else will be in that room but us. And then God will say, well, what about this? What about that? Why didn't you? Why did you defraud? Why were you so in perversion and lust and all these kinds of things. Why didn't you give that over to me? I commanded you to walk and to follow after me, to come under my blood, to walk in my righteousness. This is what I've asked you to do if you're my child. And that's why the Bible says to flee from sin, to get away from it all. Well, it's interesting as we go on in verse 7 and 8, he says, for God did not call us to uncleanness. That, that to me is, I don't know if we can underline that or even grasp that. <laughs> but, you know, we well, often we're saying, well, we're called to Jesus Christ. That is true. We're called to Jesus Christ. But when you're called to Jesus Christ, you're also called to cleanness. I didn't write it. Paul wrote it. 
Look what it says. For God did not call us. God did not call us. The church. Us individually. God did not call us to uncleanness. And the idea of uncleanness is the whole idea of well, it should be neat and tidy. The opposite of neat and tidy is uncleanness. The best way to look at, at uh, to understand this word is just go into your physical rooms or your house and is your room clean or is it unclean? Is it unkept? Is it neat or is it orderly? Has it been washed? All those things. And Paul is saying, God has not called you to be disorganized and be confused and, you know, I remember times in the past, you know, all of you know that if you have children or even grandchildren, sometimes you can walk into their rooms and you can't even see the floor. In fact, there's more clothes and junk on the floor than there is in the dresser. Things are hanging all over the place. There is disorder. Paul's saying, God didn't call you to disorder. He's calling you to cleanness. Clean it up. When the Holy Spirit puts something, touches your heart about something, clean it up. Clean it up. And you know, there's a lot of joy when you get something cleaned up. When it's finished and cleaned up. I hate being disorganized. I hate driving by properties that look like a bomb went off at their place. <laughs> you know, I like things organized. And I like things cleaned up. And Paul was saying, for God did not call us to uncleanness. So the opposite of uncleanness, he has called us to be clean, to be upright. But then he goes on and, but he said, I didn't call you to uncleanness, but I called you to holiness. And holiness is purity and devoted and sanctified. This is what he called. And this is why many people give up and walk away from God. Because they are trying to do something in their own strength instead of doing it in the strength and power of Jesus Christ. And when you go into the strength and power of Jesus Christ, he will help you clean up your life. If you're a drug addict and you go to Jesus Christ and help you, he'll help you clean it up. If you're into perversion, he'll help you clean it up. If you're into gambling, he'll help you clean it up. If you're into lying, he'll help you clean it up. If you're into cheating and stealing, he'll help you clean it up. But you got to give yourself to him as a vessel. As a vessel that you possess the vessel that God has given you and then take that vessel and give it to him. Put it on the cross. Die to oneself. And as you do that, that cleansing, sanctifying power begins to work in you because God wants to move us to holiness. Amen? Are you receiving this today? I hope that it's encouraging you. And I know it's not easy. It's a challenging journey. Because the enemy always wants us to fall. He always wants us to be dirty and grimy and, and all those kinds of things. But you know, the Lord doesn't want that. He wants us to be clean and upright and holy before him. And you know, and we know, and I know those areas that the Holy Spirit is touching on because Paul is going to just kind of tie this in. How do we get through all these things? And he's going to remind them how in verse 8. He says, therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man. So he's saying, if you, if you reject holiness and sanctification and, and being clean before the Lord. If you reject that, it's not that you've rejected men because that's the way men are. Men and women are walking in, you know, uh, dirtiness, unholiness, um, unclean, uh, walking in the power of themselves. And he says, and when you're doing that, Paul says, therefore, since he's talking about the love and what's going on, therefore, he who rejects this does not reject man. So when you're not willing to walk in this way as you have received from God, if you're not willing to walk in what you receive, what God has shown you, what God has taught us concerning our vessels, concerning lust, if we're not willing to walk and stop defrauding and taking advantage of one another, if we're not willing to do that, it's then we are saying that we're not willing to obey God. That's what he's saying here. Therefore, he who rejects this, does not reject man, 
because they're still walking like a man, but have rejected God. Reject means to deny, to refuse, to scorn, to turn back and say, no, I don't want that. They reject. You know, it's like putting some nice food on the table and you touch it and you eat it a little bit and say, I don't like it. Take it back. Reject it. You don't want it. Well, God says, when you do, when you're not willing to do these things, is that you're not rejecting man. Because they're all like that. But what you're doing is rejecting God. God is not like that. God is not a God who is unclean. He's not unholy. He's not defrauding. He's not taking advantage. He's not walking in a lustful heart. He is not trying to do his own thing. But he is calling us out from the world into his presence, into his body. Because notice what goes on here in verse 8. It's the key. You should underline this. But there's a comparison. This is not God when you're walking that way. He's saying this is not God. But, but, but God who has also given us his Holy Spirit. So then he brings to us a, a very quiet, in a sense, conclusion. How do we overcome these things of the world, these things of the flesh? And Paul is, is urging and exhorting from verse 1, saying, you know, God is trying to command us, you know, to do the will of God and to possess your vessel. And you ask, how is that possible? Because he goes on, he says, But God who has given, who has also given us his Holy Spirit. Paul reminds the church what really moved them from the things of this world into the body ministry, into the presence of Jesus Christ is the Holy Spirit. That's why many churches are starting to talk less about the Holy Spirit. You can go to so many places and you can hardly hear. Everybody is afraid of the Holy Spirit. Everybody is afraid that the Holy Spirit is going to make them do something they don't want to do. You know, the Holy Spirit is a teacher and a comforter. And Paul was reminding them that all these things that he had just taught them on, that he just spoke to them about, that the only way that they will be able to accomplish and to be able to walk in power and authority of the Lord Jesus Christ is by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. So that's why we need to be praying daily, like Ephesians tells us to pray daily, that we would be filled daily with the Spirit of God so that we can be able to overcome those things that which would be trying to possess our vessels, that we would be able to overcome the passions and the love uh, or the lust of this body. To be able to overcome those things that where we want to take advantage and defraud one another. And to be able to overcome uncleanness and unholiness. But to walk upright before God. What we need to do is to not reject God. But we need to reject the things of this world. The things that are evil. The things that are unholy. And that instead of rejecting the Holy Spirit, we need to receive the power of the Holy Spirit. Come Holy Spirit and fill me. Come Holy Spirit and empower me. Come Holy Spirit and comfort me. Come Holy Spirit and teach me. Come, 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 come. Oh, Holy Spirit, come. Don't be afraid of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is what makes it possible for you to be an overcomer. And so Paul is exhorting us that what you have received, and what is he reminding? What does he say? When, what have you received? You have received the Holy Spirit. And that's why I said in our title, receive and walk in God, or receive the Holy Spirit and walk in the Holy Spirit. Walk in the power, the anointing of God. Amen. So I pray today as we look at these things, that Paul is trying to exhort, trying to urge us on. Again, just to remind us one more time, he's urging and exhorting us to get lined up to, the, to God and his commandments and his will for our lives. 
He's urging us to possess our vessel, not in our power and strength, but in his power and strength. He's urging us that we do not follow after the passions of our own lust and to the place of, of, of taking advantage or defrauding others. He's urging us and prodding us to come on now, disciples, to walk in cleanness and holiness. And he's urging us that, that as we do, that we come back to the place of not rejecting the Holy Spirit, but to receiving and asking the Holy Spirit to continue to empower us so that we can be that overcomers, not in ourselves, but in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you again for what it's teaching us. And Lord, we do ask that you would help us, O oh God, to walk in your sanctification, is to abstain from things that are just destructive. And Lord, that, that I thank you that by the Holy Spirit today, you are urging us through the power of the Holy Spirit, Lord, to not to follow after the passions of our own lust or, or to be able to go after the things that are of sexual impurity and that. But Lord, that we would walk according to your will and according to your commandments. And most of all, we would walk the walk filled with your Holy Spirit who desires to teach us and guide us and strengthen us in our journey. And we give you all the thanks now in Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. I hope that's encouraged you today. That we don't have to do it on ourselves. But we have to ask him to come and then receive. And then to take that which he has given to us. And walk it out for God's glory. Amen. We love you. And Lord willing, we hope to see you again tomorrow. Amen. Bye bye for now.